Want to turn your business into a household name? Nine Ad Manager puts your business in the biggest shows on Nine Now, Australia's most watched free streaming TV platform. Create your campaign, manage when it runs, who it reaches, and track how it performs. You can even create your own video ad, all for only $550. Turn your business into a household name with Nine Ad Manager. To learn more or to get started now, just visit nineadmanager.com.au. From the newsrooms of the Sydney Morning Herald and The Age, this is Please Explain. I'm Samantha Selinger-Morris. It's Monday, October 30. Many of us know that the last year has been calamitous. We know this from our own visceral experience, the unseasonably warm days in winter and even in spring that tell us that the climate has gone haywire. And then there's the news. For instance, that more than 16.5 million hectares of Canada has burned this year. So when a large team of scientists says that even they were stunned by the temperatures around the world this year, that this year will probably go down as the hottest in 100,000 years, you know it's time to sit up and take notice. Today, environment reporter Mickey Perkins on the latest global climate change report and which vital signs that measure the health of our planet have been found to be pretty sick. So, Mickey, you've just written about a new report on climate change, and the findings could be a shock to a lot of people, in particular that so many planetary vital signs are looking pretty sick. So can you please tell me about this report, and what exactly are those vital signs? Okay, so this was written by 12 scientists who hail from all over the world, um, including Dr Thomas Newsom from the University of Sydney. And as they've done in the past um, three or four years, they looked at a range of the planet's vital signs. So we're thinking things like temperature, sea level rise, population numbers and forest cover as a way to try and assess a healthy planet. And their findings are pretty confronting. They found that, for example, this year, June, July, August, September and likely October were the warmest respective months since records began. This hour in Europe with the heat wave that is tearing across the south of the continent. Temperatures in the central Mediterranean are expected to peak today. And they also found there have been 38 days this year that were more than 1.5 degrees hotter than the global average temperatures, higher than any other year on record. Earth reaching its highest temperature on record for a fourth day in a row. 10 million Americans are under warning for extreme heat this morning as tornadoes... We had the huge Canadian wildfires that happened um, and they released more than one gigaton of carbon dioxide emissions into the atmosphere, which just by way of comparison is greater than that country's 2021 emissions. So for the whole emissions for last year in Canada were released just by the wildfires alone, as well as all the other normal emissions that that country would release. This is Canada is experiencing its worst fire season on record. About 25 million acres have burned so far this year. And obviously, on the tail end of some of these large wildfires that we saw in Europe and other places, there was also torrential flooding that came and, you know, affected areas that only weeks before had been burnt were then covered in torrential levels of rain. We do begin tonight with the catastrophic flooding in the northeast. Vermont, under a state of emergency tonight, some of the worst flooding in nearly 100 years. The capital. And obviously, it compounds the difficulty for humans to respond, for our emergency systems to respond when we're getting multiple weather-based extreme events one after the other. It really just wears down our resilience. In fact, the study goes so far as to say that this year will probably be the hottest in the past 100,000 years. And so I'm assuming this is why the scientists have written in their study, they've come to the conclusion that life on the planet is actually imperiled. Yeah, we're entering an unfamiliar domain um, regarding the climate crisis. This is a situation that no one has ever witnessed firsthand in the history of humanity, obviously, if this is the hottest um, year on record. And it's really worth keeping in mind that just a few percentages of a degree of warming are incredibly significant. So, you know, if you're talking about a 1.5 degree level temperature rise with a two degree um, increase, you know, there's a difference between 10 centimetres of sea level rise or an extra 420 million people exposed to more frequent heat waves. So even tiny degree increases can have a huge effect globally. 
and means we're putting every form of life on Earth under extraordinary pressure. Not just ourselves, humans, but all plants and all animals. And none of these creatures, including us, have evolved to cope with these kinds of rapid changes and increases in temperature. The other point to make is that while the Earth's richest companies and people are creating the emissions that drive this global heating, it's the poorest people who are going to be suffering. So people who created very few emissions themselves will um, feel the worst impacts. I do know that climate scientists are stunned by the temperature rises this year. Obviously, they've been predicting global heating for a long time, but they have described this as being unprecedented and almost bananas in how quickly temperatures have gone up. And so I'd love to ask you a bit more about that. You say that this is really challenging for all living things on the planet. That's sort of, you know, quite a massive thing to take in. So how does it actually on a physical level, how does it sort of challenge us? What does it do to us, this temperature rise? Well, I mean, what you're talking about really is heating. So if you heat an organism beyond its range of capability, beyond what it can sustain life, obviously you you kill the organism or you damage its ability to survive, its ability to reproduce. And whether that might be, for example, during the black summer bushfires, we saw fruit bats, you know, that were so parched and so dehydrated that they just fell from the sky. Or perhaps you see, you know, giant bushfires starting, which obviously consume all the plants and all the animals um, in, in before them and leave them, I guess, unable to find other animals to reproduce with, unable to find habitat. So there are many, many different ways that global heating affects the earth. Of course, if you're a human, you may be able to buffer yourself a little bit. If you're a wealthy human, you could perhaps have air conditioning or be inside a house or whatever. But that's not an option for most of these animals and plants that we live amongst. And we're part of the same ecosystem as them. So if the ecosystem starts to fail in other areas, it impacts on humans. Okay. And for those who sort of really need this message brought home, like how does this affect me? How does it affect us when those parts of the ecosystem are disrupted? Yeah, look, I mean, I think it, it's, I've heard a really great example given once. I think it was the writer Richard Flanagan who made it, and apologies if this is wrong, but he said, you know, you imagine that you're going on an airplane, an old fashioned airplane that's flying along through the sky and it's made of metal and it's riveted together with, you know, hundreds or thousands of rivets. Like you can lose a couple of those rivets if you want to think about a species as being rivets. You can lose a couple of, of rivets and nothing's going to happen to the plane, really. But if you start to lose more and more of those rivets and things change more and more, you start to lose stability and eventually things fall apart and the ecosystem is no different. So, um, you know, it might be possible to lose animal species and plant species through extinction and not suffer too greatly to begin with, but the more the ecosystem changes and starts to collapse, the, the more that we begin to not be able to farm productively, to move efficiently, to, you know, to create wealth, all the things that humans have relied on doing for such a long time, um, our entire way of life and our entire global kind of community, I guess, is under is under threat because of that. And you've written as well, of course, the impact that this is having on ice shelves in Antarctic melting and what that's doing to the ocean temperatures. So what sort of impact does that have on us? Sure. So just to give you an idea of what this means, so if the ice sheet in West Antarctica, for example, melts completely, oceans are expected to rise by five metres globally. So that just gives you an idea of how much water and how much ice is stored in these frozen ice caps and how much change that would make to the seas and the oceans if this water was released as fresh water. You know, usually ice shells have gone through cycles of rapid and short-lived shrinking and then they've regrown slowly over time. But now we're seeing that half of these West Antarctic ice shells are shrinking with no sign of recovery. The other thing is that this melting has major implications for this conveyor belt of currents that we have going around the globe. And these circulate heat and nutrients, which obviously affects all sea life and all life in the oceans. These are climate patterns and and weather patterns and, I guess, ocean current patterns that have been like this for many, many millennia. And even in the last 50 years, humans have managed to disrupt these patterns. And I guess in some ways it's difficult for us to know exactly what that will mean in the future. But for example, with the ocean currents, if we're not having a regular circular movement of currents as has always happened, it completely disrupts 
all of the life that depends on those seasonal patterns. So, you know, you, you, everything from nutrients not being available to create the smallest elements of life in the sea, like krill or invertebrates, macroinvertebrates, through to the, you know, the birds that rely on those smaller species, the whales that rely on the krill. Like it disrupts all the patterns that have been established over hundreds of thousands, if not millions of years. That's the kind of effect that humans are having on their planet at the moment. We'll be right back. Mickey, I want to discuss fossil fuels because they're driving so much of this. And the study actually found that subsidies for fossil fuel companies actually doubled between 2021 and 2022. So were you surprised by that figure? And why is this happening? Yeah, so when we talk about fossil fuel subsidies, we're talking about governments giving money to to companies through things like tax breaks and other financial measures, and also taxpayers having to foot the bill for the health costs of things like climate change. You know, just think about the huge health costs that come, for example, with a heat wave or or a large bushfire. So I'm not particularly surprised by this because I think it's really important that we continually remind ourselves this climate crisis is being driven by humans extracting and burning fossil fuels. Coal, oil and gas account for 90% of all carbon emissions. These soaring temperatures indicate to us that the world is likely to reach 1.5 degrees of warming as early as next year, which means we will fail to meet the central goal of the Paris Agreement. Now, you know, there is a global shift away from fossil fuels to renewable sources of energy, but it needs to be strongly accelerated, and I can't overstate this enough. The rate of change that's happening is simply not enough to meet the challenges we face in terms of warming temperatures. And so is that why the scientists write in their paper, quote, unfortunately, time is up? That's a scary sentence if I've ever read one. So what exactly did they mean by that? Well, I mean, think about this year so far. Already we've seen record-breaking temperatures, wildfires in places like Canada and Europe flooding worldwide, and we haven't even officially reached a 1.5 degree of global average temperature rise yet. We haven't even passed that officially, and yet these are the kind of effects we're seeing from global heating. Just think about if it it goes um, to where scientists expect it to go in terms of 2.6 degrees perhaps, maybe even higher. The reality is if, if you're a privileged middle class person in a first world country like Australia, you might be able to afford to buff yourself from some of it. But, you know, of course, no, nobody's um, able to avoid bushfires and flooding um, if, if you live in regional areas or if you're exposed in some ways. The scientists who wrote, you know, this study and, and, and other similar sort of climate work, they really warn against reading all of this information and feeling despair. I mean, it is hard to to come away without feeling despair. But actually, um, if you give up on climate action, it makes it even worse for the generations that come afterwards. So if if we take action now and we, we make the cuts that we know we need to make now and start to do that work now, the effects on our children, our children's children, the generations that come after them are enormous. We can actually affect enormous change for those people that are to come after us. And if you think of yourselves as humanity as sort of custodians or guardians of the earth, that's something that we should all be striving for, I think. And so you've been covering climate change for a long time now. What, I guess, surprises you most about this report I mean, is it the fact that most of us are still so inactive when it comes to doing what we need to do to turn around what's happening with climate change? I mean, the stats show that most people are very concerned about climate change. They're aware of it. They, you know, they wish that they knew what to do about it. They often feel overwhelmed by climate change and knowing how best to respond. Now, the reality is it's not about making individual changes on a very sort of micro level that is what we need at the moment. What we need are macro changes on a major level, and that can only come from governments. So governments putting pressure on coal and gas companies to start to make a shift away from those fossil fuels towards renewables, governments encouraging policies that you know, encourage electrification of transport, those sorts of things. It's not something we can solve individually. It's something we have to solve as a society and as a community as a whole. The good news is, and there is good news, is that we already have the answers that we need. So we have the renewables and we're doing them at scale. We're doing solar farms, we're doing wind farms, we're learning how to store energy in large batteries. All of this is possible. We have the technology to move away from fossil fuel consumption, but what we need is the political will to do that. Governments that are going to step up and make the difficult decisions when it comes to turning the boat around towards renewables rather than fossil fuels. And also, you know, having a population of people that are willing to lobby their politicians to call for these kinds of changes. It's really worth doing. We have the solutions, but we just need to do it really, really quickly. 
I mean, it reminds me of something you said right before we started recording. You said, we've got the answers. Imagine if we didn't. Yeah, well, I mean, this is the thing, right? We actually have the technology to solve this problem. If we didn't have that technology, I'm not quite sure how anyone could be feeling hopeful. But we do. We've, we've managed to invent these incredible technologies that can deliver us renewable, zero emissions energy to power the world and to create, you know, sustainable systems. We've got it there. All we can do now is to encourage our governments to put it into place and put it into place really, really quickly. So perhaps the final message is the people have the power? <laughs> of course, always. Thank you so much, Mickey, for joining us. Thank you. Today's episode of Please Explain was produced by Julia Carcatzel with technical assistance by Chi Wong. Our executive producer is Ruby Schwartz. Please Explain is a production of The Age and the Sydney Morning Herald. If you enjoy the show and want more of our journalism, subscribe to our newspapers today. It's the best way to support what we do. Search The Age or smh.com.au forward slash subscribe. I'm Samantha Salinger-Morris. This is Please Explain. Thanks for listening.